The Blind Swordsman, Author Vegan Master, Chapter 13, Suspicions and Drink. Ken traveled quite a while before getting a scent of other humans. More precisely, he managed to find tracks of quite a few people, leading through the woods in what seemed to be a clearing somewhere. Ken followed the tracks and the smell for a while, all until he started smelling more and more things in the distance. His other senses were also picking up movements and sounds. I must be close to a village of some kind. Ken jumped from tree to tree without any restriction, before eventually stopping himself. This blade on my back will definitely attract attention to me. Ken realized at that point that his crimes would be known if the long blade was recognized by others, and if a wanted poster was made of him, the situation would be a bit more annoying. Ken had thought about taking his revenge on the Land of Iron and its Lord, but he wanted first to kill the Seven Swordsmen before that. So he wanted to lay low for a while, to avoid alerting any of his enemies of his survival and her whereabouts. Therefore, Ken quickly decided on a course of action, jumping a bit away from the village and finding a large tree. Ken managed to climb it quickly, needing only a leap to get on top of it. He unsheathed his large blade, letting the sheet fall to the side on some branches as he directed its tip to the bark of the tree. His long blade slipped into the bark of the tree with ease, Ken burying it completely, including its hilt. With one finger touching the hilt of the blade, Ken flowed his chakra into it, widening the hole in the process and slightly burning the inside of the tree. Ken pulled the blade out with a thread of chakra, sheathing it again and sliding it right into the small hole that he had created. With his weapon hidden, Ken proceeded to walk towards the village, keeping his katana strapped to his belt for protection. It wasn't an uncommon thing to do in the Land of Iron. The majority of travelers carried weapons, and it was more uncommon to see one unarmed. He was still alone though, something that travelers used to avoid due to the constant presence of mountain bandits, which meant people would still look at him weirdly. Ken walked by plenty of people, many of them turning their heads and staring at the strange ronin, coming alone from the wilderness. At first, some thought it was a lost child, and wanted to approach it and ask about its parents and whether or not it was safe. The poor villagers didn't have any means to take care of a child, but they could at least report the appearance of one to the proper authorities, and make sure they are sent to an orphanage. But their thoughts about it being a child dissipated after seeing him walk a few steps into the village. The katana sheathed on his belt said all that they needed to hear. The confident gait and the controlled breathing that not one of them could even feel. The person in front of them was most certainly just an extremely short man. A short man that also happened to be a highly trained samurai slash ronin. His physique was hidden by armor and tattered hides. His hair was overgrown and spiky, reaching all the way to his lower back. His hands were covered in dirt bandages that looked old to anyone that saw them. One phrase could be used to describe the wandering ronin, and that would be a fine mess. Fine as in, his confidence didn't seem to be hindered by the fact that he looked as if he'd just come out of a war. But his confidence didn't really change the fact that he needed a new outfit. If it wasn't for his somewhat clean clothes, people would have actually thought he was fleeing a battlefield. But the rags he was wearing were clean, albeit ripped and torn in many places. Ken walked more and more, eventually finding what was essentially the only in slash tavern in that small village. He walked in without anyone stopping him, many already deciding not to get involved with him at first sight. Ken's appearance didn't exactly help him get along well with other people. His mask wasn't exactly a friendly sight. He simply had a troubling presence that prevented others from approaching. The fact that Ken was a wandering samurai meant that he could only bring trouble to a peaceful village. So a lot of the people inside the building went away as soon as they saw him enter, emptying the chairs around him as he took his seat at the bar. Give me some sake. Ken's voice was raspy. He hadn't used it in a long time and the last time he had it was to laugh like a madman and or interrogate a victim. Right away? The barmaid looked at the ronin with a raised eyebrow. His voice sounded young, but she couldn't quite put a finger on it. Regardless, child soldiers weren't all that uncommon in their lands anyway. Many families sold away their children to lords in order to get rid of unwanted children. Those children were usually either just used as slaves for labor or turned into child soldiers depending on their talents. The world wasn't a nice place, everyone knew that, but everyone did their best to live a good within their own bubbles. Which was why getting involved with a suspicious-looking stranger wasn't quite ideal. 
Oi, you brat, are you even old enough to drink? But not everyone was as reserved. Every herd had its black sheep, and drunkards wasting away their health by drowning themselves in alcohol wasn't all that uncommon. Unfortunately, alcohol had the side effect of dampening one's reasoning and thought process. Ken didn't bother replying to the drunk man's grumble. The barmaid placed down a cup in front of him and poured him a full glass of sake. Huh, Aquino, didn't think you'd actually give it to him. Why'd you refuse to give me dash, Fariyevil.cm? The drunk man's words were more and more disjointed as the conversation went on. His demeanor seemed to weird out the barmaid. As she took two steps back, the drunk man just laughed, extending his hand to drink Ken's cup of sake. Before his fingers could even touch the cup, the hilt of Ken's sword was already shoved into his mouth, making some of his teeth creak as the drunk's gums seemed to bleed visibly. The drunk man's eyes widened as he quickly took two steps back and fell on his ass, grabbing at his mouth and screaming in muffled agony. Ken didn't do anything else besides that, he hadn't even moved his head during the altercation, making others think he wasn't even looking at the drunk man. The drunkard was injured and in a lot of pain, but he was also extremely angered by what had just happened. He was going to get up and show that arrogant Ronan in his place. Thankfully, his suicide was unsuccessful. As two other men intervened and dragged the drunk man off before more problems rose. Sorry for that, Ken said as he tilted his head a bit. The scared barmaid also bowed a bit and muttered an apology. The rest of the clientele were also able to sigh in relief when hearing that. At the very least, the traveler wasn't all that bloodthirsty. He also had decided not to deal any serious injury to the drunkard, although many other ronin in his place would have likely cut off a limb or two from the drunkard, merely as a show of power. At least the young man in front of them was not a violent individual. Ken then took off his mask, his head was forever facing his sake glass. Many patrons were rather curious about the swordman's hidden appearance. He was clearly powerful so it only made sense for him to hide his features. Usually, talented people were also the most beautiful, so some of the female clients present were watching the short man take his mask off with quite a lot of expectation in their gaze. Ken didn't bother to hide his face, but not many managed to get a glimpse of it, as his head was angled downwards, seemingly staring at his sake cup. Ken downed the glass instantly, then placed his mask back on just as quickly as he had taken it down. He released a satisfied sigh, as the familiar taste of alcohol filled his mouth and somewhat numbed his molars. Drinking was something that Ken had wanted to do for quite a while now. He had always enjoyed a good drink in his past life. It was a habit that he had given up. But after losing his family, he felt the need for one familiar taste of his past, to remind him once more of what type of person could thrive in that world. By now, Ken obviously knew it as well. A family man and a caring person would only be wronged in that world without proper strength. Even if they had strength, they would still be taken advantage of, as that was the way of the world. No, the ones that truly thrived in that world were the ones that were just like he had once been. Senseless killers, hunters looking to sate a sadistic kind of hunger. Be it money, fame, or even pleasure, only those that were willing to kill for it would be rewarded. As that was the type of world Kin found himself in, Kin drank with thoughts of his enemy on his mind, as he reminded himself of something. From now on, the men I will be facing will all be just like I used to be. Those who murder must be in turn prepared to die, just like I was. Let's see if they have the same principles as I did. With that thought in mind, Kin got up and left, the familiar taste of alcohol still in his mouth as he hummed his way out of the tavern leaving behind a rather mortified barmaid. The barmaid had been the only one to see Ken's face, or what remained of it. It honestly looked like he had been mauled by a wild animal. She froze up when looking at that face for the few seconds that it had been in view. H, how can someone live like that? No, scratch that. How can someone become a powerful samurai like that? Her thoughts quickly started jumping from theory to theory as she tried to rationalize what was in front of her. The man had no eyes to speak of, so how exactly was he accurate enough to not only shove his hilt into the drunkard's moth, but how exactly was he navigating around so normally, as if nothing was different about him when compared to others? She was so shocked and entrapped in her own thoughts that she had even forgotten to ask Ken to pay for his drink. Chapter 14 
realization, and search. Ken had spent the last few days gathering information covertly within that village. He had managed to get some information in the village from listening to rumors while hidden on rooftops. Now, shinobi weren't exactly a subject matter for villagers of the Land of Iron. But this particular village happened to also be at the border with the Land of Lightning. So, the matters of shinobi did seem to concern them quite a bit. That was how Ken managed to find out more about the war that was happening outside of the Land of Iron, concerning all of the other elemental nations. It was titled the Second Great Ninja War. Apparently, shinobi were quite prone to starting wars with each other. The Land of Iron was a neutral land, so it was usually left out of the conflict. It was also a powerful nation, so no one tried to take advantage of it or start any war with it. But the villagers that lived at the borders of the Land of Iron were still in danger sometimes, as injured shinobi could sometimes flee to that neutral land out of desperation and bring trouble and conflict to the otherwise peaceful life of the villagers. Ken was very interested in hearing about the war. War caused chaos, and chaos was something he could easily use to his advantage. So he collected as much information as he could in the following days, scouting in the evenings and at night. Then he retreated to a random tree in the forest during the day to rest for a bit and think more about the information he gathered. Now was the time to reflect on the information he had gathered. From the start, Ken already knew that learning the techniques of the shinobi he heard so much about was going to be hard. But he only realized that it was going to be actually impossible as he sat there and thought more about the situation. The techniques of shinobi were mostly guarded by clans and hidden villages. They had a monopoly on them, and only a few basic ones were out publicly. The ones that were out were the ones that Koji had bought him on his birthday. They weren't all that special, and all academy students ranging from 6 to 12 could perform them with varying levels of mastery. Ken heard more and more information about conflicts happening near the border, which made him hopeful about finding a few soon-to-be corpses and searching them for any scrolls with techniques. It wasn't uncommon for training shinobi to sometimes carry their training materials with them, so Ken was rather confident in finding something. That was where his biggest hurdle came in, though. How exactly would he go about reading and learning them? The first thought that Ken had was to simply borrow a shinobi form the battlefield and lightly coerce him into reading out the scrolls for him. But the problem was that most shinobi were taught about interrogation techniques and how to act in such situations from the age of six. So Ken knew that it would be hard to tell if they were lying to him. Unlike the usual gate guards that he had interrogated before, he now had to deal with trained child soldiers, so things were a bit more difficult. Ken also thought about paying one of the villagers to read the techniques out for him. But none of the villagers likely wanted to be implicated in anything related to shinobi, so it would be hard to find one willing to help. Rumors would also arise if he got refused too often, and his suspicious activity would get him reported to authorities and on the radar of the samurai, and also the shinobi that infiltrated the Land of Iron. How do I find someone willing to help me? No, I'll think more about it after actually getting the scrolls that I need. Ken smiled underneath his mask as he started resting for the day. He would start traveling after resting for a bit. Ken didn't rest for long, though. His sleep was also not deep, merely dozing off and resting his tensed-up muscles and tired bones. He started traveling as soon as the sun started setting, collecting his main weapon from its hiding place and starting to jump towards the land of lightning. Ken instantly noticed the change in vegetation and weather in between the lands. The land of lightning seemed to always be cloudy. The temperatures there were a bit less arctic, although not exactly hot by any stretch of the imagination. Ken could hear the thunder in the distance as he traveled covertly. The clouds cast shadows in his surroundings, as his speed turned him into nothing more than a black blur that moved across the leaves. Eventually, after an entire week of traveling and scouting out the lands of the shinobi, he was able to find out more about the land of lightning. The nights were especially stormy, but the days were rather warm, so he had a nice warm blanket of the sun while sleeping in a tree. After traveling further into the land, Ken eventually found the tracks of a group of shinobi. He tracked group after group, looking for his intended target for days on end. He didn't bother to even try and attack groups with only adults, as they weren't exactly guaranteed to have anything related to training on their person. Three sets of lower-sized sandals, and one with bigger sandals three child soldiers, and one adult, likely the team leader. Ken proceeded to follow the tracks around for a while, 
shinobi weren't the easiest to track, all of them being adept at hiding their tracks and moving covertly. Hell, without his enhanced senses, Ken wouldn't have been able to track them at all. Eventually, Ken found the group, camping in a small cave. Three young boys and one masked adult. Ken stalked them for a few hours while trying to decide on a course of action. From their direction, he could tell that they were headed even further inland, most likely going back to the hidden village. At that point, they were unlikely to run into any enemies, unless they were ambushed in the middle of their own territory. That wasn't exactly a matter with high probability, so Ken decided to take them first and take everything he could find. When attacking such a well-structured group, one would always strike the strongest enemy first, deal as much damage while taking them by surprise. Ken was confident in his stealth and assassination skills, confident enough to kill just about anyone with enough preparation. But the current situation made his stealth skills quite useless. The group were holding out in a small cave, on the side of a cliff. It was a strategic position and one that allowed the group to hold out easily. Assassins are always annoying to deal with. Ken knew that from his past life, the adult was likely also a skilled assassin, at least as skilled as the Seven Swordsmen of the Mist. Against an experienced assassin, one couldn't exactly just rock up to their front door and hope to be able to take them by surprise. No, the Jonin, leading the team of what were most likely Jenin, was already expecting an attack. He was in a state of high awareness even while on allied territory. Ken could respect that, the mark of a truly skilled individual was exactly that, not having your guard down at any time, in any situation, not even in your own home. That was also the reason Ken had managed to kill all of the assassins after his life when he was ambushed by his partners. He wasn't expecting them to do it, but he was prepared for it. Alas, he had only been strong enough to kill them, unable to escape afterwards. He was limited by the strength that humans could achieve in that world. Dot. Now he was strong, but he wasn't about to fight head-on against people that had such strange techniques. It didn't seem like a smart option at all. After thinking for a bit more, Ken started analyzing his enemy a bit more. The cave was a great position, one that allowed one to perfectly defend against attackers, but was that really it? Sure, it was decent for a night, but it was a bit strange, not exactly what Ken would have chosen. No skilled assassin would ever leave himself this open. If an assault truly happened then they'd just be stuck in that cave. Defending, this wouldn't be a good option. So, Ken started stalking around the small cave, climbing the cliff and circling around the forest for a bit. Eventually, he found it, a small hole underneath the trunk of a great tree, hard to notice with the open eye, but Ken was able to sense it, as the tree had already died because of it. This was definitely dug up in preparation. The Land of Lightning should have plenty of such camps around their territory. Ken quickly took a mental note of that, before slipping into the hole and landing in a small tunnel. He was forced to take his long blade into his hand. He contemplated bringing it with him, but it was far too long to use comfortably in a closed environment, so he decided he'd rather keep his smaller katana for now. Ken walked silently further in. By now he could smell his targets. He didn't have anything against them, he didn't hate them, but they were unlucky enough to be the first such group that he had found. It's kill or be killed. All of them are the same. Ken had no choice in the matter. He could either get strong or die trying. The people he was attacking wouldn't hesitate if they were in his shoes, so he wasn't exactly racked with guilt. After all, everyone he was facing was the same as he once was, and so, Ken unsheathed his blade silently and continued walking down the dark tunnel, prepared to do what he knew best. Chapter 15 Assassination and Scrolls Now, Ken knew he couldn't simply approach the shinobi from behind and expect it to work perfectly. Any skilled assassin would pay attention to both entrances to their hideouts, even if one of them were technically a secret escape route. A jonin would likely have traps prepared for both sides, and methods to escape from assaults on both entrances. Ken knew that, but he also had absolute confidence in his technique and lack of presence. The traps weren't enough to hold him back, he was easily able to feel them as he didn't need to rely on his eyes. The cavern he was in was completely dark, and an intruder would only be able to see using a source of light, which would likely alert the jonin hiding in the cave. Thanks to those factors, he was able to get closer and closer to his target, 
crawling on the ceiling like a reptile. He was using an extremely small amount of chakra only on his fingertips and the tip of his shoes to stick to the rocky surface. It wasn't a difficult technique. Ken had mastered it during his training while looking for ways to better utilize chakra on his own. He was basically imitating a spider's movements, which was exactly what he had been attempting to do anyway. And, just like any spider, he was preparing to wrap his webs around his prey. Currently, the Jonin and two of the Jinin were resting. All of them sat down with closed eyes. The third boy had his eyes peeled open at the entrance, sometimes also turning his head slightly towards the hidden escape path, likely having been entrusted by the team leader to do so. Now, usually, this would mean that it was a free game for Kin to just kill them all in quick succession. But he could easily tell that the Jonin wasn't actually resting. He seemed to simply have his eyes closed and he was faking his breathing, making it shallower to imitate the one of a sleeping person. But Kin could distinguish it, a slight alteration still existed here and there. His enhanced senses were easily able to pick up any irregularity, no matter how small. The Jonin had likely decided to rest when getting back to their city and to safety. Ken stopped just a few meters off of their spot, just a few centimeters off where they would be able to spot him thanks to the campfire's light. Well, at least the Jonin would be able to spot him. The Jonin weren't anywhere near skilled enough to notice him as long as he stood close enough to the rocks. Ken decided to do what he knew best, create a distraction and go in for the kill. A technique as old as time, but still one of the most effective. Ken formed a hand sign with one hand, creating an imperfect clone right underneath him. It didn't have a face, and its armor was of the wrong color, but it was enough. The clone dashed towards the sleeping Jonin, while Ken crawled further, passing through the light of the flame in the same instant, as the Jonin jumped up and stabbed towards the clone with a kanai. The Jonin was prepared for something to happen. His instincts had been telling him about something happening for a while. He felt watched, but he simply couldn't feel anyone or anything nearby. The second his eyes caught sight of that shadow coming from their built escape path, he instantly attacked it. He didn't stop to consider the possibility of it being a clone. It was impossible to discern with how little presence his pursuer had. Just as his kanai was about to pass through the clone, he saw it simply disappear as he felt a metallic string cutting into his neck. Instantly, the Jonin reeled back substituting himself with a lighting clone which had its head swiftly cut off. The Jonin instantly started making more hand signs, preparing to spit out a large fireball in the direction of their escape paths. Just as his chest rose up, he felt the air leave his body. Ken was crouched up behind him, his blade already inside the Jonin's lung, missing his heart as the Jonin shifted his position slightly by reflex. The Shinobi gasped, turning around quickly and spitting fire behind him. The Jinin by the campfire all quickly scrambled out of the way, most having just realized how dire the situation was. Run! The Jonin shouted, hoping that they'd at least escape and report the situation. Just as those words left his mouth, Ken stabbed a Senbo toward his temple. The Jonin quickly ducked, avoiding it perfectly as he cursed the lack of lighting within the cave. His opponent was basically dancing circles around him. His previous fireball had only served to rise up smoke and take away even more of his vision. Ken jumped from wall to wall, throwing Senbos and Shuriken towards the Jonin in quick succession. The Jonin quickly made a few more hand signs, a wall of earth rising in front of him as he tapped the ground. Unknowingly, that move had already sealed his fate. The Jonin hadn't even managed to notice it due to the chaos, but he was already facing toward the entrance and Ken had always been directing himself towards it. In raising that wall, Jonin had cut off what little light he had, and he had also managed to leave his students alone with Ken. The Jonin had no idea that had happened, still looking around warily as he waited for his ghastly opponent to show himself. Meanwhile, on the other side of the wall, the Jinin had barely managed to reach the cave entrance before Ken appeared in front of them. All of them quickly stalled, but they seemed to have plenty of training as they all instantly started making hand signs. Ken could feel them, but they were much slower than the Jonin. Ken's katana was still stuck in the Jonin's chest, but he didn't need a sword to deal with Jinin. Before any of them could even finish their first jutsu, Ken was already in front of the closest one to him, his hand piercing through his chest cleanly.
The one that had his chest pierced was too flabbergasted to do anything, his hands falling limply to his side, his body suspended in the air on Ken's arm. The sight of his quick and terrifying death managed to somewhat shake the still inexperienced Jenin. This led to one of them making a small mistake in his hand signs, as Ken threw the body toward them. The one that had also been flustered was hit head-on, while the one still making hand signs managed to jump to the side. His jutsu finally being finished as he brought his hands together one last time and shot a smaller ball of fire toward Ken from his mouth. Ken shot from his position, jumping from wall to wall like a frog and appearing behind the jenin in less than a second. The jenin had taken out a kanai, but didn't even get to turn around before Ken grabbed his head and crushed it into the nearby cave wall. Ken then simply threw a sinbo through the head of the last jenin, who was still getting up and pushing his teammate's body from atop him. The entire confrontation with the three jenin had only taken five seconds. Ken was rather pleased with the time. He was also pleased with seeing so many jutsu from the shinobi. He had remembered very few being used in the show, so he would have a blast learning more of them. Just a few seconds after he finished the jenin off, the wall in the middle of the cave was blasted apart, with the jonin jumping out, clutching his side, not even having removed the blade yet. Then he saw the scene in front of him, with all of his pupils dead and strewn across the floor near the cave entrance. Shit. The jonin finally lost his cool with that, failing to notice the figure clutching onto the roof of the cave, right near the entrance. Just as he was looking around, Ken's hands reached down, before the jonin could even react. His gaze was forcibly moved behind him, forcing him to stare at the blown-out campfire he had just come from. Vuvuha? Those were the jonin's last words as Ken landed soundlessly on the ground right in front of him. Ken then proceeded to start scavenging the corpses of the jenin, as the squad leader simply fell on the floor, motionless. The blind assassin whistled happily as he found more and more supplies. Each of the shinobi had been carrying a pouch. Each pouch had at least twenty shuriken and three kanais. Ken strapped all of them to his belt as he continued to search their pockets. Most of them were empty, only carrying some random pills that Ken had no clue about. The jenin that seemed to have trained the most did seem to have three scrolls on him, which made Ken extremely excited. Ken also found a few scrolls on the jonin, and he basically took everything that he could carry with him. After that, he threw all of the bodies inside the cave, right over the fire. He sat down and warmed himself up for a bit, ignoring the smell of burning bodies as he went and retrieved his blades. With everything he owned back in his possession, Ken departed from that cave. Outside of it, he decided to cover his tracks a bit more, taking out his long blade with a smirk. His chakra flowed through the blade, flowing in as nature energy also started filling the blade, making it vibrate slightly with the wind. Ken didn't bother with much buildup this time, merely swinging his blade in a downward motion, sending a flying slash into the cave. The cave shook as the rocks were cleaved and pushed aside. The flying slash kept cutting into the rock for at least 50 meters, as the cave simply collapsed. Ken then proceeded to just flee, not even leaving a footprint behind for evidence. Chapter 16 To Find One's Eyes <laughs> So acquiring the scrolls wasn't all that difficult in the end. Well, I can only hope that they are scrolls with techniques and not just mission details. There should be something here though. How many mission detail scrolls can they even have anyway? I'll be able to discern them as soon as I get someone to read them for me. The problem is finding someone willing enough to do so. Traveling back to that village on the border won't take me long if I just take a straight line and don't try to find any shinobi tracks. I think I had my eyes on someone that should be capable enough to read shinobi techniques. Out of everyone in the village, his chakra reserves were the greatest. Even comparable to some chunin, I think. Well, better get to it. I should be able to convince him to help me. If he's talented, then I might even recruit him. He's a bit older, but it should be fine. I should be able to train just about anyone into a professional killer. I wasn't exactly a spring chicken when starting my killing spree either. Age doesn't matter much in this job, only limits the ones without imagination. I was 21 when starting my worldwide killing spree in my past life. They only managed to catch me at 42. Well, I'll see if I can salvage a warrior out of him. 
Building a small organization would help me quite a bit in this world. I especially need information. I need the organization to act as my eyes in this world. The more I see, the stronger I am. It will take a while to build it up, but I should be able to do so. Now, let's see how he responds to my invitation. This is... It wasn't a great month for Tasho Jitomo, especially the last two weeks. Ever since the incident at the bar where he had harassed a stranger carrying a blade, not only were a few teeth on his mouth loosened, but the other villagers also started to hate his guts after that incident. He was the common village drunk. He worked all odd jobs that he could find in order to fuel his alcohol addiction. But all of that was ruined due to one stupid mistake on his part. He couldn't even blame the swordsman that had briefly visited their village, as he hadn't escalated the situation either, merely pushing him away with the sheath of his sword. But that incident led to the disaster that was unfolding in his life currently. Due to being deemed a troublesome individual, no other citizens were willing to give him any jobs. No one was allowing him to help in any fields, no lawns to moan down with his scythe, and no fences that needed fixing. So, he was now stuck drinking away the last pennies he had. His pouch was getting lighter and lighter every evening. He wasn't even allowed in the bar anymore, so he had to buy his drinks and get drunk in the field, all by himself. And I was set up to have such a nice future. Tasho could still remember the time when he had gone to school, the Shinobi Academy. Tasho was initially born in Kumogakure, the village hidden by clouds. He was young and hopeful when he finished his studies. He had been top of his class once, only to be instantly thrown into a war the second he graduated. Still wet behind the ears and forced to kill people for his village. His luck hadn't been good though. Running into a Chunin in his first confrontation, he was heavily injured and forced to flee to the land of iron. By now, he had completely integrated into life there, long since forgetting most of his techniques. Very few he could still remember only those that he could use in his daily life and for convenience. His country had never looked for him either. Why would they ever care about a mere jinnin missing during a war? He was likely just written off as dead and forgotten about. As an orphan, he didn't have anyone to return to, no one to miss him. I worked so hard back then. What the hell happened to me? He was now laying in a field, drunk and dizzy, while staring at the starry sky with glazed over eyes. Once dubbed a talented child, now nothing more than a 31-year-old waste of life. And, just as he was mulling over those thoughts, a shadow seemed to cover his face. Tasho blinked a few times, confused. Then he noticed a small figure towering over his head, staring down at him as if he was nothing more than a bug. Tasho was instantly alerted, but he couldn't get up, his body refusing to respond to his commands. So, he was stuck there eyes wide open, staring at the red, on the mask of the figure in front of him. This shit. It's him. Tasho instantly recognized the person standing over him, but he was too dizzy to do anything. Is he here for revenge? I guess I was nearing my end anyway. And just like that, Tasho closed his eyes, waiting for his death to come swiftly. You seem tired. Instead of drawing his blade and slicing his head off, the figure spoke. A raspy voice seemed to scratch at Tasho's ears as his eyes cracked open again. He could see the figure tilting its head slightly, its black locks flowing in the wind as its blood-red armor shined in the moonlight. Heh, didn't think you'd be chatty. If you don't want to kill me, then what do you want? Come to laugh at me? Tasho scowled a bit. He wasn't really a fan of the situation, but he couldn't exactly move yet either. It was a miracle that he could even think straight with how drunk he was. So noisy. So helpless. So pathetic. Ken reached to his back, took out his long blade, still sheathed, and stabbed it into the ground right near Tasho's head. The former child soldier didn't even flinch, only narrowing his eyes once more as he started to regain feeling in his body, the fear sobering him up effectively. Wadash Tasho's words were interrupted by Ken's own voice. Do you really want your end to be this pathetic? Tasho's eyes widened in shock when hearing those words. It had been a while since he had heard someone express such disappointment towards him. Is your silence a sign of you giving up? I guess you were nothing more than a drunk at the end of the day. 
The world won't miss you. Ken's raspy voice ground at Tasho's ears, and his eyes filled with rage when hearing Ken's tone and words. Ken then unsheathed the katana at his waist, bringing it over his head, preparing to decapitate the drunk Tasho. Like hell, I won't give up this easily. Tasho's voice sounded out as his body seemed to tremble in rage. Ken's sword came down slower than his usual speed. As Tasho rolled out of the way in an almost practiced motion, making Ken smile under his mask. I guess you weren't such a waste of time after all. That was the last thing Tasho heard, as Ken appeared in front of him and slammed the hilt of his katana into his chin, knocking him out instantly. Ken then grabbed his blade, pulling it out of the earth and placing it back on his back, and sheathed his katana once more. The blind swordsman then walked over to his unconscious new recruit and grabbed him by the collar, dragging him off into the night. I will start by training him a bit. After he's more familiar with me, I'll be able to talk him into being my eyes from now on. Chapter 17 Harsh Training and Respect The next thing that Tasho knew when he woke up was that he was in a cave. At least he assumed so, as he couldn't see anything at all. It was pitch black. Not a single thing could be made out. He couldn't recognize where he was nor remember how he had gotten there. But he knew what had happened before that. That masked man. No, it should be a child. That tone of voice is too strange. Tasho could clearly remember almost being beheaded by that masked child. The hairs on the back of his neck stood when he remembered the feeling of cold despair that had washed over him in those final moments. Through newfound willpower, he had managed to somehow roll away most likely thanks to his previous life as a child soldier. Still, the masked child showcased a much superior speed to his own and knocked him out almost instantly. Is he a shinobi? Or maybe a samurai? The Land of Iron doesn't involve its young in warfare like the elemental nations, so that shouldn't be the case. Tasho quickly started struggling against his bindings. The rope around him seemed to be wrapped loosely, which allowed him to move his arms to some extent. Slowly but surely, his bindings came off, and he shakily got up. He was thankfully not hurting anywhere. He ran his hands across his body to make sure, so he was well aware of his own condition. While touching the wall, he started walking forward blindly, hugging the wall for as long as he could until he eventually reached an entrance. It didn't lead outside, and there was no light in that room, but Tasho could tell it was bigger the temperature in it dropping a bit, and the echo of his steps becoming a bit more noticeable. Tasho continued walking to his side, sticking to the wall, knowing it was his best bet at finding an exit and avoiding any holes that he could fall into. That was when it happened. Dodge. A raspy and low voice followed by something more substantial. A loud thump and a burning sensation on Tasho's side. The sheath of a long blade hitting him in the side and sending him tumbling towards the middle of the large room. Duas instructed, was the first thing Tasho heard when his ears cleared, and he managed to catch his breath once more. He quickly got up, opening his eyes and trying to look around desperately, but the room was still pitch black, so he might as well have not opened his eyes at all. Dodge. He heard again, and before he could even react, another strike hit his leg, making him kneel once more. He expected a follow-up, so he put up his guard in a hurry, but nothing came. Tasho recognized that voice now. It was also the only person obviously looking to torment him in some way. Why are you doing this? Tasho asked with a frantic tone, still kneeling as he raised his arms around his head in a defensive manner. Drunk, useless, weak, pathetic. The words echoed in that cave as Tasho clutched at his head in fear. Do you want to go back to that? Or do you want to become strong? Ken's voice sounded in the cave emotionless, uncaring, absolutely chilling for the scared former child soldier. Tasho tried his best to locate Ken using that voice, but he had no chance thanks to the echo in the cave. He looked around frantically again, hoping for something to happen, and then Ken's words finally managed to sink in. This, this isn't some form of torture or prolonged execution. This is training? Tasho immediately realized what was happening after that. Ken wasn't his enemy, but rather the opposite. The masked child wanted him to grow stronger. Tasho had no clue why that was. How was he, 
a washed-up drunkard and former child soldier, supposed to be of use to someone like Kin. Kin was an exceedingly young, talented, and powerful swordsman slash shinobi. And he? Well, he was already past his prime. No one would even give him the time of day. So why? The more he thought about Kin, his masked attacker, the more confused he was. But there was also a feeling of awe slithering in the depths of his mind. Kin was even faster than Tasho's former Jonin teachers, while being most likely younger than or just as young as academy graduates. Tasho took a few seconds to mull over his life till that point. All that he had gone through, and the humiliation he had suffered. After that, he started getting up again. If someone like him shows interest in my talent, then I will at least try not to disappoint him. Dodge. Another auditory cue was given, and another blunt strike hit him. This time, his guard was up, so his arm took the brunt of that hit. He rolled on the ground. The force of that strike made it clear that it wasn't meant to be blocked. The second Tasho got up again. He heard Kin's voice again. Dodge. A bit louder this time, and he was struck in the back. This continued for a while, as Tasho slowly remembered the jutsus he had learned in his youth, that stressful situation managing to force them out of his mind in order to find some way to defend himself. He tried to use a sensory technique, but he wasn't able to get even the faintest whiff of a chakra signature beside his own. Then he got struck down again. Then he tried to use a defensive jutsu, raising an earth wall. The wall was broken instantly, and he was sent flying further, injured by both the sheath and the broken rocks. Making clones also didn't work. Tasho wanted to use a few more visual illusions, but each time he tried something he was struck to the ground regardless. With each word spoken, a strike was sent Tasho's way, and more and more pain accumulated. With each strike, Tasho grew calmer. The more pain he felt, the more focused he became. Eventually, nearing the end of that grueling training, he managed to sense one single strike. He could feel it approaching, a moment of pure comprehension, as his eyesight seemed to be forgotten completely. Tasho had no clue whether it was thanks to the auditory cue or a sickening sense of premonition after hundreds of strikes, but he managed to roll away in time. Ken's sheath hit the ground loudly, and that was also where the training stopped, as Tasho collapsed to the ground, unable to get up anymore. He was injured, to the point where he couldn't even move anymore. I can't. I'm too tired. Tasho felt his entire body burning with both fatigue and pain. There was not a part of his body that was uninjured. He was not passing out, holding on with sheer will. Then he started to hear a rock being moved, and a light shined into the cave room, clearing up his surroundings as he closed his eyes, readjusting slowly to the sunlight seeping into the large cave. He was in a cave that seemed to have been formed naturally, but was in large net unnaturally. The room he had come from was also dug up. Then he saw a shadow coming closer and closer to him. Looking up, he saw that exact same mask that had looked over him in the past. The same wild and overgrown spiky hair. The same blood-red armor covered by a tattered black cloth. You did a lot better than anticipated. You lasted around five hours even. With this type of determination, you are bound to go far above ordinary. Ken's voice sounded out. This time his tone wasn't cold or uncaring, which shocked Tasho. Instead, it was warm prideful even. Tasho smiled widely when feeling the odd warmth in Ken's words, before finally passing out in the warmth of the sun. Ken simply let out a sigh as he looked at his trainee. A lot better than I expected. He actually surpassed my expectations a lot. He was quite resourceful too. I guess my judgment was right this time around. Ken shook his head in the end, retracting that last thought as another one replaced it. Can't say his success has anything to do with me though. He was the one to motivate himself and break his limits. In that manner, Ken gained a newfound sense of respect for his trainee. I should probably get to bandaging him though. Don't want him dying on me. Chapter 18. Trust, Organization, and Techniques. Three weeks. That was all it took for Tasho to completely respect his new master slash teacher, who he now knew was named Ken. Tasho felt odd about addressing a child with such titles at first. But one thing became clear after a while. Ken certainly had the skill to be called those things. 
He also had the temperament and mentality of a teacher. If he didn't know any better, he would have thought Kin was actually a lot older than him. But he could tell Kin's age rather easily, especially after spending so much time with him. The biggest indicators came in when Kin was relaxed, which was only whenever he took a three to four hour nap. Tasho somehow could tell that Kin was still alert even then, but when his body was relaxed, he looked about as normal as a child could be. Well, without the red armor, mask, and swords. Kin's voice was still somewhat hoarse, but the hint of youthfulness in it was a lot more pronounced now that he had a bit more practice with social interactions. The masked child also didn't bother to change his tone or even hide it in any way. He simply couldn't care less. Tasho actually learned that Ken was actually using his age as a weapon against others. People will drop their guard more when they see their opponent as a child, even when child soldiers are common. Since everyone was once a child soldier, adults tend to have more confidence as they also tend to think they have more experience. Tasho sweated a bit when hearing that explanation. Well, they do have more experience. Normally, Adult Shinobi had a lot more practice and experience than any academy child. Tasho could somehow tell that this wasn't the case with Ken. Maybe it was a gut feeling? Maybe it was somehow related to the fact that Ken had decapitated a bear and sheathed his blade in the blink of an eye. Regardless, at that point, Tasho was well aware that sticking around with Ken was for his own benefit. In those three weeks, Ken had trained him daily. And at that point, he was a lot more proficient at dodging hits while in the dark. Although he still got hit often, Tasho was satisfied though, as he had made a lot of progress in an extremely short time. His reflexes also got sharpened quite a bit. He had lashed out to Ken at some point early into their training, as he found it particularly harsh and he couldn't quite see how it helped him at the time. Ken didn't even answer him. He simply swung his sheathed sword towards him and out of reflex, Tasho actually blocked it his eyes widening but as his body had almost reacted instinctively. Even if your mind has some catching up to do, your body has already learned a lot. That moment had somewhat humbled Tasho once again, as he decided to stop questioning Ken altogether. Then he learned about Ken's condition. He found out in a strange way, as Ken simply took off his mask to eat some meat. Usually, Ken would have just moved it slightly to the side and eaten like that, but now he decided to take it off completely. This had most likely because he had gotten a bit more comfortable around Tasho, who was basically his student at that point. That was the first time Tasho had gotten a good look at his teacher's face. It was a bit stomach-churning. It certainly wasn't what he had been expecting. So a conversation started. H, have you always been like that? Tasho asked while scratching the back of his head, unsure if Ken's condition was a taboo subject or not. Surprisingly for him, Ken didn't seem bothered by that question. Since I was born, I guess I was just unlucky in this aspect. Though, my luck manifested in different ways. Ken couldn't deny the fact that he was lucky. He was lucky to have been born with a special body, even if blind. He was lucky to have been rescued and raised by his real family, the samurai. He was only alive thanks to that luck of his. Otherwise, he would have died not long after his birth. I see. I mean, I understand. Tasho seemed to be somewhat unsure of what words to use, which made Ken chuckle a bit. Don't bother mincing words with me, recruit. His voice sounded serious for one moment, sending a shiver up Tasho's spine as he muttered back. Why yes, sir. Swordash. I'll be honest with you. Ken continued to speak, making Tasho stop his unneeded apologies. You are the first of many. You are to be a leading figure for the group that I plan to build in the future, a teacher and a mentor. Tasho's eyes widened when he heard that. He immediately felt flattered at being given that opportunity. He still considered himself a washed-up genin after all. T thank you. I will do my best to meet your expectations. He kneeled before Ken this time, showing his loyalty as well as his desire to grow stronger. No need for that. Needless posturing won't get you far. Ken's words caused Tasho to awkwardly get up but he still appreciated that Ken didn't ask him to lower himself. The organization will be my eyes, my ears, my nose, and my sword if I so desire, Ken said as he leaned on the long blade he carried with him. I understand. Do you plan to compete with the hidden villages? Tasho still wanted to know more, since he was meant to be a leading figure, 
He needed to at least know the forces they'd be facing in the future. I've no gripe with the villages. We will mainly collect bounties from the bingo book, which will be our main source of income. Tasho nodded when hearing that, somewhat glad that they weren't going to be gunning after the hidden villages. No organization made in a few years could take down a hidden village after all. They had too much power in the form of unique bloodlines and decades of experience. Tasho didn't even want to think about the number of soldiers the villages had. Thousands died constantly in their wars, yet they seemed to be able to throw more and more shinobi on the front lines as they competed with one another. The hidden villages were a frightful existence, and that was just what Tasho knew on the surface. Ken didn't bother explaining more than that, and the two of them continued to train. This time, Tasho also took his duty more seriously, and eventually, Ken finally felt that he could be trusted enough to help him with reading the techniques. Tasho was elated to be trusted with such an important duty. I am still in training, yet I am already tasked to be the eyes of this person. He's already helped me change my fate. I owe him at least this much. With Tasho's help, Ken was able to find out that three of the scrolls he had gathered were actually just mission details. One of them was a scroll on equipment storage seals, which Ken was immediately interested in. Tasho remembered them from his life as a shinobi. They are basically pockets of space created through basic fuinjutsu. This particular one only stores inorganic objects. Ken instantly decided to learn them after finding out that tapping them and applying chakra was all that was needed to take out the weapon. Rio L. C. Finally, a way to hide my weapons while traveling. Shinobi arts are truly a wonder. The other jutsus written down on the scrolls were rather rudimentary. One was a fire release. Great fireball jutsu. It was considered a rather powerful C rank jutsu that could go up to B rank if one was willing to spend enough chakra on it. Another was earth release. Earth style wall. Which was actually a B rank jutsu that the jonin had used. And the last one. The most promising one besides the equipment storage seals is lightning release, lightning clone technique. It was a B-rank technique that the Jonin Kin had killed used. It required quite a bit of chakra, and it seemed to also require one to have really advanced control of their chakra, as well as to have the lightning attribute. Thankfully, Kin fit into both categories, so he decided that the clone technique was a must for him. Those were the only scrolls with any techniques, and Kin decided to actually learn all of them in the end. He had also given Tasho free reign on which he wanted to learn. From Ken's perspective, the more tricks they had up their sleeves, the better things were for them. And so, the training continued. This time, Ken also practiced Jutsu seriously for once. Chapter 19 One Year of Hardship <laughs> And so, Ken and Tasho trained earnestly for the following year and a half. In and out of that cave, sometimes venturing out and finding more scrolls and equipment. Ken's luck was quite good, and his stealth skills were also impeccable. Regardless of how many times he entered enemy territory, he always left it unscathed and undetected. Most of his actions would be written off as attacks of enemy shinobi. The time of war made it easy for Ken to cover his tracks perfectly, and he knew to take advantage of that. He didn't just attack one place, though. He traveled a bit more sometimes being gone for weeks on end in order to acquire more diverse techniques. At some point, a few months into their training, Tasho became accustomed to it, and Ken was able to notice it as well. Instead of waiting to be hit, he now was able to anticipate attacks, blocking, dodging, and even hitting back at times. It was clear that his instincts had improved greatly, showing that he wasn't exactly lacking talent before, just willpower. So, Ken took his training to the next level no longer giving him an auditory clue, and just hitting him. It took Tasho a while to get used to that, but he was able to. During that time, he had also mastered some jutsu, and he started using them effectively even in training. Ken had no problems with that, as he allowed Tasho to use everything he had at his disposal to either dodge, block, or make him retreat. The rules were that there were no rules. Well, with one exception, fire jutsus were a bit of a no-go as Ken usually hit him harder when using them, and once even ended the training early. Ken's explanation for that? Using fire-style just do in an enclosed space is beyond stupid. Fire burns oxygen, which is the main component of the very air you breathe. Ken always sealed off the cave they trained in perfectly to prevent even a speck of light from getting in. 
So running out of oxygen was a possibility inside there. The cave was large, large enough to sustain them for a few hours of regular training. The fire burned through that very quickly though. Ken made sure also to give him a thorough explanation of some basic scientific concepts after that incident. Tasho was like a sponge. He absorbed as much knowledge as he could, and he seemed to be eager to learn more at all times. And, after an entire year of struggling, Tasho was now able to cross blades with Ken in a spar. He wasn't as strong physically, and he wasn't as fast, but his reflexes were trained to an insane point, which allowed him to keep up in a short spar using only kinjutsu, sword fighting, and taijutsu, fisticuffs. Ken always managed to overwhelm him with only skill though, as he was always holding back physically during their spars unless it was to prove a point and show Tasho that he still had a long way to go. Tasho growing complacent and thinking he was too powerful was the last thing Ken needed, so he made sure to beat any thought even similar to that out of his head. Overconfidence is a slow and insidious killer, was a quote that Ken remembered from somewhere and that perfectly applied to his line of work. Being overconfident meant not taking things seriously, and not taking things seriously was just a way to die quickly. Now, Ken had grown a lot during that year, and he was slowly approaching his 10th birthday at that point. He was already tall for his age, standing at around 1.55 meters, 5.08 feet, and his muscles were also becoming more and more well-defined. No one was to mistake him for a child anymore, not that many had in the past. Tasho was also loyal to him at this point, seeing Ken as the only reason he now had a chance to live a better life. Now, Tasho no longer looked as he did before, no longer the same skinny waste of life he had been before. Now he was a lean and fit assassin, likely stronger than the vast majority of Chunin, even possibly at the level of a Jonin. At that point, in Ken's eyes, Tasho only lacked a few more advanced jutsu that one would need to be called a Jonin but his taijutsu was definitely on par. Tasho's progress mirrored his renewed passion, his power growing exponentially as he underwent Ken's hellish training. And, after reaching this point in his training, he was also given a uniform, F-R-A-W-B-N-V dot, a coat that covered his body completely, black and completely discreet, and with plenty of pouches that contained throwables. He received a large straw hat, which covered his head completely, and had white strips of clothing going downwards and covering each side of his head. But, the most important part of the outfit had to be the mask. It was very similar to Ken's own mask, but instead of a dot in the middle, it only had one, somewhat thick, red line. Ken made it so that the ranking in the organization he was building would depend on the masks to some extent. Tasho was to be the only one with a single line. The first blade. After him would come two more blades, and after that would just be the numbered. Ken was looking forward to developing the organization, and it was about time he started doing so. Currently, Ken wanted to expand his influence, to become stronger before poking the proverbial wasp's nest that was the Mist Village. Ken found out more about the Seven Swordsmen during the one year he had been training Tasho. They were basically the cornerstone for the Mist Village, their swords being akin to national treasures to them. And Ken had no plans to just hand them over to the Mist Village, after killing the swordsmen wielding them. They were rightfully his spoils of war. So he needed to prepare to face the entire village if needed. Though he assumed he'd just be able to hide from them if needed. As long as I kill them covertly, I won't even have to worry about the mist. But killing the seven of them without making any noise whatsoever will be impossible. So, Ken decided to start developing his organization. And to do that, he needed money. A lot of money resources, a proper base, it would all take time, which he had, but money, which he'd need to acquire. He and Tasho theorized a bit on where to get that money and who exactly they could recruit. They reached a rather straightforward conclusion. Tasho would handle recruitment and finding a proper base, and Ken would handle the gathering of money for the entire operation. Ken did make sure to put a rule in place for their recruitment. We are not allowed to force regular people to join us and we must avoid getting them involved in any conflict we encounter at all costs. Ken truly didn't care about any shinobi or samurai, as soldiers were always prepared to die, but he didn't want the same fate to befall civilians. Tasho was quite fine with that, as he wasn't exactly planning to recruit civilians in the first place. He was to start building a few homes for new recruits, 
There were plenty of trees in the forest thankfully, so they didn't need to spend any money on that. But he would use the rest of their savings for tools and other building materials. Now, Ken was to earn money, and he had found the perfect tool to do so. The bingo book. The book contained all wanted shinobi and criminals with information on their bounties and where to collect them. The bingo book also gave some information regarding the abilities of these people, giving them ratings and being constantly updated. So, Ken left the cave with a stack of papers, handwritten by Tasho, and he was to hunt down all of them. And so Ken started making his way through the forest, dressed in his usual red armor and black coat similar to that of Tasho. He didn't bother wearing a hat though, as he didn't care about it too much. He also didn't have any backpack or blades on his body. Instead of bandages, his wrists now had leather guards with storage sigils on them, allowing for easy transportation for both his weapons and his supplies. It was about time I embarked on a long journey anyway. I've yet to feel a lot of this world. Who knows? Maybe I'll even visit the hidden villages? Chapter 20 Wandering Samurai Ken wandered the land, jumping from tree to tree as he mapped out the areas he traveled in his mind. Many of his targets were Ru Shinobi, and he only had a rough estimation of where they could be. Tasho had done his best to help him memorize some locations on the map, even going as far as to draw him a map of the continent with a pin. Ken was able to easily feel the location of certain landmarks and roads from the imprints of that drawing, but that didn't mean he was easily able to tell where exactly he was on it. That was his main issue. Even with his hyper-enhanced senses, he still had quite a bit of trouble navigating around. Even when he somehow, through a miracle, managed to pinpoint where exactly he was on the map, the second he moved he would somewhat lose that position after a while, which got him back to square one. The only good thing was that he was able to at least find a good direction to walk towards after a few stops. He started hunting down a random criminal, renowned killer and rapist, someone going by the name of Sezatoyanso. Ken only knew about him a bit, that he hanged around the Land of Lightning, and that he was well known for kidnapping young Kunoichi for obvious reasons considering his reported crimes. His crimes weren't really the only noteworthy thing about him though. An S-rank missing shinobi was able to escape the encirclement of three different jonin at some point in the past. The full scope of his abilities, unknown. Ken figured he'd just be able to deal with him anyway, which made him think back to reading about his crimes. I guess beasts like him are common in every world. Ken wasn't exactly outright impressed by what he was reading. He knew plenty of similar people from his past life. War zones were fought with soldiers taking advantage of locals. It was almost a tradition for war zones at that point. But he didn't think much of them besides the fact that their desires were a lot stranger than his. He thought that he was just as disgusting as they were, so he had no right to judge them at that time. Now he saw things in a different light. I may still kill, but I am a changed man when it comes to mentality at this point. I refuse to compare myself to these beasts any longer. He decided that he'd kill any beast he came by if the opportunity arose. But he otherwise still didn't feel the need to hunt down criminals specifically. He wasn't planning on becoming some righteous crusader, nor did he really have any right to. The first few days of wandering the Land of Lightning were quite uneventful, can even manage to set up camp and make a fire. I'm not here to attack any shinobi, so I couldn't care less if they find me. His intentions were different, and so were his actions. There was now no reason for him to really hide. He was actually aiding the Land of Lightning by hunting down a criminal for them. Ken didn't bother to rest for long. He was young and full of energy. The natural energy revolving around him almost didn't want him to rest. And so, the blind swordsman decided to take it a bit slower, scout out the terrains. I'm unlikely to just run into the criminal if I run around at high speeds everywhere. In truth, Ken also wanted to take a few moments to appreciate the fresh air around him. Appreciating nature is something I've only taken to during this lifetime. I guess I was too focused on other things to appreciate small things like this. Ken continued walking slowly through the forest for a few hours, not bothering himself with hiding his presence like he usually would. He only stopped himself when he noticed that he was encircled. He wasn't exactly worried though. He wasn't approaching the people of the Land of Lightning as an enemy. After all, he didn't have anything to hide. 
but he also had no reason to pretend that he couldn't feel them around him. The four of you can come out now. I can tell you've been tracking me for a while now. Ken's voice rang out clearly as he stood tall in that clearing. He noticed that four people were basically encircling him in the middle of that clearing. He could tell that they were a team of Jin and most likely with the Jonin leading them. Quite perceptive for a random traveler, the Jonin was the first one to speak up. Ken could tell from the amount of chakra flowing inside her body. The team seemed to be led by a woman by what Ken's ears were picking up. He sniffed the air a bit. He could tell rather quickly that two boys and a girl were part of that team. I'm not exactly a regular traveler, miss. How should I call you exactly? Not exactly of importance, but I'll play along. My name is Mabui, obviously a shinobi of Cloud Village, something you should be aware of. You are in our territory after all? The woman seemed to take out a kanai as she spoke, seemingly preparing in case can prove to be less than friendly. The jinnin around her did the same. Now, now, no need for hostilities. I am not involved with any of the hidden villages. Your wars don't concern me much. Ken raised his palms in a defensive manner, not wanting to start up a fight with people that weren't even his target. Target? Who? Ken took a closer look at the people around him. The female Jonin seemed to have a relatively attractive form. Ken could feel the wind bending around her figure. He smiled as he came to a realization. She seems like prime bait. Though our resident degenerate might rather aim for that Jinin girl. No. Regardless of who he aims for. This entire group is good bait, but I should make sure they don't have any important mission. I don't want to get involved in conflicts between villages now. And we're supposed to take your words at face value? When you don't even show us your face. Haha, <laughs> nice joke. One of the Jinnin said. The boy then quickly looked away as his Jonin teacher slash handled gave him a stare down. Although my pupil was rather rude, I would still have to ask you to take your mask off. I don't know how accustomed you are to shinobi ways, but those that wear masks always have something to hide, Mabui said as she narrowed her eyes at Ken. Although her tone was more polite, her accusation was about as obvious as her pupils, maybe less pointed and gruff. Ken frowned a bit, but ended up slapping the back of his head in frustration. I guess wearing masks is associated more with the secret operations unit of villages, the Umbu, was it? They may not be voicing that specifically, but they're certainly thinking about it. Tasho did tell me a bit about them, but I didn't think much of it at the time. Q. I don't mind taking off my mask, but I must warn you. It is no pretty sight. Ken said as he slowly started taking off his mask, a small smile rising on his lips as he did so. He wasn't scared of showing his face to others at all. If it wasn't for the mask being a gift from his loved ones, he wouldn't even bother wearing one. He also somewhat liked the design so he mostly wore it. There was no denying the fact that his appearance would stir some reactions in others as well, so there were really few reasons for him to take it off most of the time. Now, however, it only seemed sensible. The four shinobi around him seemed to be preparing for something as Ken's mask was taken off. An ambush or anything. Umbu went by an extremely strict code. They were to never unmask themselves, not even to allies. So if Ken was to actually be an enemy, then he likely would throw a smoke screen and attack them before they even caught a glimpse of his face. Their doubts fell off when seeing Ken's face though. Eyeless, mangled beyond any recognition. It was absolutely impossible to accurately pinpoint his age, but Mabui could still tell that he was relatively young. Either late teenager or young adult if she went using her intuition. It was clear that Ken was either highly trained or malnutritioned. She could see no excess fat on his sunken cheeks at all. I would say he's trained. No one would keep their composure in such a situation otherwise. For a second, Mobui even thought that he was using some type of Jinjutsu to hide his face. But as a Jonin, she wasn't able to feel anything. There was always the question of who exactly trained Kin, but at the very least, he didn't seem aggressive. We're still on a mission. I would question him more under normal circumstances, but I guess this should suffice for now. Mobui nodded. Sorry about that, traveler. Some questions are still in order, but I can tell that you didn't come here to make enemies at least. If he planned to attack us, he wouldn't have shown his face, nor would he be so deep into our territory while doing so. Our reinforcements would quite literally appear in seconds. Ken then put his mask back on, 
ignoring the reactions of the people around him as he sighed and continued to talk. No apologies needed. You're just doing your job. Now, I'll stop speaking in circles. My name is Kin. I am a ronin, wandering samurai if you will, though you can likely tell from my armor. I am also a bounty hunter. It's how I make my bread. I am here tracking one, says a Toyinzen. A missing mean last spotted around the land of lightning. Kin's voice rang out confidently in that clearing, confident and unshaken. Mabui ended up sighing, not exactly sure what to think of this bounty hunter. On one hand, it did make a lot of sense, as he did seem strong, and he didn't seem hostile at all. But now she actually felt a bit guilty about technically forcing him to take his mask off. So you're hunting down that animal? I should warn you, he's pretty strong. A squad of Jonin from our side is already trying to track him though, Mabui said as she finally put down her weapon and crossed her arms. Her pupils followed her motion of putting down their weapons, making Kin sigh a bit at the almost mechanical way the child's soldiers were moving. It is understandable that more would be after him, but I do happen to want his bounty, so I don't plan on giving up on it. Kin's confident tone didn't waver one bit though. Poo. So you're saying you're going to go against the Cloud Village and compete for his bounty? Mabui seemed quite amused at the notion. Her pupils also seemed to raise an eyebrow at Kin's arrogance. Well, I have my ways. Anyway, I'll be seeing you people. Maybe we'll even end up going after the same bounty one day? Kin then started walking off, waving at the group as he made his way through the forest. Mabui was about to say something, before she stopped in her tracks. Realizing that the second she blinked, Kin was completely out of sight. Even as a sensory type, she couldn't sense him anywhere in the forest nearby. Maybe it's better that we avoided a fight with that one. Chapter 21 Lapse in Judgment, Precarious Situation and Bounty <laughs> Teacher, what was that guy's deal? The young girl Jenin asked as she jumped from tree to tree alongside her Jonin handler Mabui. Mabui herself was still contemplating that strange meeting. It's strange that I've never heard of someone like him before. He's far too strong to not have a reputation, unless he's just starting. He looked really creepy. One of the other Jenin muttered as he looked ahead with a slightly scared gaze. It's unbecoming of a shinobi to be startled by the appearance of another, especially out in the field, where each second counts and the lives of your teammates are on the line, Mabui said as she stopped in the middle of a clearing, signaling her disciples to stop as well. But I can't deny that his appearance is unusual. His strength was also rather hard to pinpoint. He's likely not an enemy the four of us could have faced. She continued while looking at her students with a sharp gaze. It was better for them to learn how to discern dangerous people like Kin when out in the world. All it took was showing disrespect to some bloodthirsty bounty hunter, and they'd likely end up dead if they were lucky. I don't know about that. He seemed pretty young. I don't think you'd have any issue facing him, teacher. One of the Jenin said with utmost confidence, making Mabui simply sigh. The other Jenin also nodded, seemingly agreeing with their teammate's assessment. I am disappointed in you. I thought you were told this in the academy already. You can't judge people merely based on appearance. Just from his chakra reserves, he had an advantage over me. And from the way he left, he also has an advantage when it comes to speed and stealth. It's hard to judge his sword skills, but I doubt they'd be any less. Mabui shook her head at her disciples. Fareyevil.cm The Jenin were a bit shocked. Not one of them had managed to truly notice just how big of a threat Kin was. W. What about his jutsu? It's unlikely he practices any. He said he was a samurai, not a stray shinobi or missing mean. While it's not good to take his words at face value, he had no real reason to lie to us. Especially since he likely could have killed us. The jinin wanted to ask a few more questions. Boom. But all of them were interrupted by a huge explosion. The forest and trees around them shook in the wind as all of them covered their faces. A fight. Mabui was shocked. This was supposed to be just a small patrol mission. We aren't even that far off from the village. Who would dare get this close? Ganbu, send a message to the village and follow us after. Hikari, Chiburu, both of you come with me. The Jinin quickly nodded and followed orders. 
One of them quickly summoned a small bird and started writing a message, while the other two followed behind their teacher as they quickly went to check things out. Mabui and the other two jinn advanced without any fear, though the jonin was feeling quite stressed at that moment. This, the feeling was only exacerbated when she caught glimpse of a corpse, or what remained of it, a blackened and charred body. From the headband's location, she quickly guessed who that person was though. A former colleague of hers, and a jonin, just like her. This is bad. She quickly stopped in her tracks then, as she saw two other figures struggling against another man. She immediately went white when seeing who that man was. Seza Toyanso? Shit. So you're telling me three fully-fledged jonin aren't enough? The two of you, quickly go back and regroup with Ganbu, retreat to the village. This isn't a fight where you were able to help, Mabui whispered as she crouched down and prepared to approach the fight silently. The jinnin listened and turned around, fleeing the scene, only sometimes looking back in fear at their teacher's back. Now, Mabui needed to think of her next move carefully. A sneak attack's my only chance to turn things around. She was a sensory type, but she was still a jonin. She would be able to turn the tables if she managed to land a good attack and she was going to use her strongest jutsu in order to do so. Earth release. Swamp of the underworld. Mabui muttered under her breath, finishing her hand sings and tapping both of her palms on the ground with a grunt. The ground underneath Seza, their resident murderer, quickly turned into mud, his feet sinking into it as he was stopped in his tracks by its stickiness. Seza immediately turned his head towards the one responsible for that, eyeing Mabui up for a second. A somewhat busty woman with darker skin and white hair, wearing a standard black jonin uniform. The murderer licked his lips when seeing that, making Mabui scowl at him. The jutsu allowed Mabui to somewhat seal off his mobility, as he sunk a bit deeper into the mud pit. The other two jonin immediately took advantage of that. One of them quickly took some distance and started forming some hand signs, while the other slashed at the missing neen with a lightning-covered sword. Seza looked at them with a smile for a second, before he immediately exploded into a large mass of lightning. Mabui covered her eyes with a grunt. A clone? When she looked at the situation again, she could clearly see that the closest jonin to that clone was shocked unconscious, while the other managed to completely dodge the attack. Shit! Mabui sensed a presence appear at her side. She only managed to slightly turn her head to the side before she got kicked into a tree. She could only spit out some blood as she looked at Seza with a hateful glare. The tall, middle-aged shinobi only looked back at her with a cocky smile. Upon taking a closer look at him, Mabui could see a few scars littering his bald head. He was also wearing a jonin uniform, although his was bloody, presumably stolen off of some corpse. He purposefully didn't kill me. Shit. She was mad, but at least now she had another chance to take him down. The other jonin was also still alive, so she still had some hope left in her. Fire release. Fire dragon flame bullet. The jonin in question finished his hangings, shooting six smaller fire dragons towards Seza, who scoffed a bit. Jonin are always a pain in the ass. Seza's hands moved far faster than that of his enemy, becoming a blur as he finished his jutsu by pressing his hands on the ground. Earth release. Earth style wall. A gigantic wall of dirt rose from the ground in front of him, and the fire dragons blasted it apart quite quickly, but it still gave Seza more than enough time to do something. Hiding behind a piece of the wall, his hands turned into a blur once more. Lightning release. Shadow clone technique. The shadow clone was a technique he had stolen off one of his jonin victims at some point. With his lightning release, it formed a clone made completely out of lighting. That technique was the whole reason why he was able to become as powerful as he had become. Although taxing, the technique was extremely powerful, and the murderer was already completely used to the drain it had on him, as well as the many uses it could have. Seza quickly ran out of hiding and started throwing kanai and paper bombs towards the jonin. Earth release. Hiding like a mole technique, the clone silently dove into the ground as Seza distracted the jonin. Mabui took notice of that. Although injured, she wasn't about to let that type of thing go. She quickly started doing her hand signs. Earth release. Tearing earth turning palm. Just as she was about to tap her palm on the ground when she noticed that a paper bomb was already in front of her. Mabui only got to cover her face before she was blown away, 
and Seza scowled a bit. I don't like how many resources I am using in this fight. Better end it quickly. Fire release. Fire dragon wall. The Jonin shouted as a ring of flames rose around him, capturing Seza inside. Oh no. What am I to do? Seza said smugly as he threw another kanai towards the Jonin, who simply scoffed and tilted his body to the side. That very second, the earth to the side he had dodged into shifted. A tanto stabbing through his torso in that very instant, charged with lightning as it fried some of his organs. Shit. The Jonin forced his body to move, kicking the clone, which only caused it to explode and take him out of the fight for good. Huh. Good riddance. Seza patted his shoulders as he started walking over to the only enemy he really cared about. Time to have some fun. He licked his lips once more when seeing the Kunoichi getting up from the ground, her hands hanging limply by her sides, as she had just used them to block an explosion. Shit. This isn't good. I hope my students got to call reinforcements in time. If I can hold this monster here for long enough, maybe there is at least hope for him to pay for what he's done. She had mostly given up hope of winning the fight. She would normally simply kill herself, as she was trained to do in case of capture, but this time there was still hope for reinforcements to come. So she decided to try and hold him there for longer. Seza Toyanso. You despicable scum. That didn't mean she'd have to pretend to like her situation though. Heh. It'll be great to hear your squeals. The S-rank missing Neen rubbed his hands together as he spoke a creepy expression rising on his face. To think I'd end up like this? Mabui was ashamed, that was for sure. Not much could be done about it, though. At least that was what she thought at first. Her eyes widened, though, when she saw a very familiar masked man creeping behind Seza, a brooding figure covered in a black coat. Only a small part of his chest was visible through it, showcasing a blood-red samurai armor. She couldn't see his hands, but his long hair flowed in the wind, and his mask was just as recognizable as before. It's him. Still, her reaction did give his position away, as Seza turned instantly and jumped backwards, dodging a Senbo which was aimed at his neck. The Senbo landed right above Mabui, who simply sweated a bit as she realized her mistake. A critical one at that. To think I am lacking to this extent. There was also another thought in her mind. Will Ken even be able to win here? Seza is a lot stronger than reported. I need to warn him at least. She opened her mouth to speak, but Ken's own words interrupted her. It would be nice if you could just die quietly, but Ken didn't seem bothered in the least. Not that one could tell by looking at him. His tone did give it away though. He sounded bored, almost disinterested. It was so disconnected from the situation that Mobui was flabbergasted for one second. As if... Seza quickly jumped backwards once more and started making hand signs. His speed was impressive to Mabui. Shit. I spent too much time here. This guy is likely a big shot, Umbu. I need to create some diversion and escape. At that point, he didn't bother himself with Mabui anymore. Not about to lay his life down for a piece of ass. His plan was simple. Use a large-range jutsu. Forcing the Umbu to try and rescue the injured Jonin nearby and allowing him to escape. He was extremely confident in his speed. To him, there was no Jonin faster than him when it came to hand signs. Many had tried to take him on, and just as many had died. At the end of the day, that was his greatest talent, his dexterity. But when he got to the third hand sign of his jutsu, he simply stopped as his eyes widened. Mabui was confused for a split second, and then blood squirted out of Seza's shoulder, and one of his hands fell off. Ken was right in front of him his two fingers coming out of his large coat, exuding a large blade of chakra from them. You aren't really worth using a blade? Ken said as he pointed his fingers at his target. Seza was completely white at that point, realizing that he had bitten far more than he could chew. W.Y. Dash, Seza opened his mouth once more, about to plead for his life most likely, but Ken simply swiped his hand, and his head flew off swiftly, not one more syllable coming out of his mouth. Mabui was simply petrified at that scene. A shinobi that she had seen three fully-fledged jonin lose against was taken down in a split second. She could only gulp, as the speed he had showcased far surpassed anything she had seen before. Well, all but one person. Only Lord Rakage can surpass his speed. 
Ken simply took out a scroll and grabbed Sez's head, not even letting it fall on the ground as he stored it inside the scroll. First Bounty Acquired Chapter 22 Bait, Twin, and Collection Plants <laughs> Mabui stood there for a while, contemplating the logistics of meeting and talking to an actual Kaga-level samurai who also happened to be a bounty hunter. Now, saying that Kin was Kaga-level might have been a bit much, but Mabui really had no good frame of reference on anything in between Jonin and Akage. The criminal that Kin had just decapitated was also in between a high Jonin and a low Kage level of strength, but he was far from being called an actual Kage. Sure. Most Kage would have been able to kill the criminal with just as much ease. But there were plenty of others that might have been able to do the same. The title of Kage was only reserved for the strongest in the village usually, but that didn't mean the title didn't have a number of contenders in each village. As a Jonin, she should have had a bit more information regarding that, sure, but she was still relatively young. And she had yet to witness the change of a Kage in her time as a Shinobi. She was unaware of the power struggle that ensued when a village was to change leadership. That was the time when all the hidden powers made themselves known, vying for control. Most people would scoff at Mabui for comparing a vagabond samurai with the leaders of established clans of powerful shinobi, even if she did so unknowingly. But Mabui wasn't ignorant, and she was well aware of the fact that there were many stronger than her in the world. But she was also well aware that when it came to speed, there were few that could ever boast of being anywhere near as fast as what Ken had shown off. And currently, all of those people were masters of some movement technique, either secret technique or regular mastery over basics coupled with great talent. She had seen plenty of them, and their rakage was considered to be the fastest at that time. In speed alone, without any established technique, Ken was already near the top. And that wasn't all of it. His techniques were something else entirely, she had no actual knowledge of them, but Mabui could surmise that they were a lot more complex than what she was accustomed to. Controlling everything from his breathing to his body temperature. Absolute control over one's body, being able to blend perfectly with one's surroundings. Whoever created this technique must have been either a genius or a madman. She had heard of people being capable of controlling their bodies to sickening degrees, but none were actually able to do so and hide their chakra signature as well. The blind samurai in front of her was able to do just that. Ken then proceeded to search the criminal's body for a while, finding a few scrolls and storing them on the same scroll as the head. That gave Mabui a bit more time to calm down and regain her bearings. She had thankfully met a Kage or two before, so she knew how to carry herself. She was to treat him with respect befitting his strength, for as long as he didn't bear his fangs towards their village. Even without a village backing him, an individual with his strength can prove a worthy enemy for any hidden village. As she was further contemplating that, the Kaga-level bounty hunter simply turned around and started walking into the forest. W wait, Mabui said instinctually, wanting to at least thank Kin for saving her. But at the same time, it had downed on her how convenient the situation was. Kin just happened to start walking out of the woods as soon as the criminal was distracted by her. Wait, was he using me as bait? He must have known the criminal's tendencies and likely location. I guess he's been tracking us ever since we met. Oh, apologies for using you as bait. In truth, Ken didn't even bother to hide it either. Why would he? Anyone with a brain and some foresight would have been able to come to that conclusion, let alone people that were part of the shinobi world. I was going to thank you, but I guess we did use each other to some extent. Indeed, you owe me nothing, nor do I owe you anything. That apology was mostly out of politeness, Ken said as he continued walking into the forest. Mabui at that point also got up, but she didn't pursue him in any way. Not like I could keep up with him, though I'm sure Lord Rakage would have loved to meet him. Ken then stopped suddenly, turning his head in one direction and tilting slightly in a confused manner. Hmm. Boom. An explosion could be heard in the distance and Mabui's eyes widened as well when hearing where exactly it had come from. Shit, my students. She quickly got up and dashed in that direction, ignoring her tiredness as she passed by Kin, who was still standing there with a bit of confusion present in his mannerisms. The Jinin are in danger? The criminal is dead, that much I am quite sure about. 
Would enemy shinobi attack this close to a hidden village? Isn't this a bit too brazen for them? With a bit of curiosity, Ken decided to scout out the situation a bit more. He immediately became a blur, as his speed carried him through the wind, stepping from leaf to leaf and reaching the source of the explosion. He actually arrived there quite a bit sooner than Mabui, as his speed far exceeded hers. The scene he saw was about what he had expected. The genin were mostly unconscious, with the two boys suffering from burns on their bodies. The only one still conscious was the girl, and she was being held up by the neck, and Kin could only raise an eyebrow when sensing the person that was holding her up. Didn't I just kill him? Was that a clone? No, his aura is slightly different, not weaker, but different. Then it simply ticked for Kin. It was a rather easy conclusion to come to as well. A hidden twin brother, huh? That would explain how the criminal always managed to escape from every situation. Even if Seza was a bit better than some Jonin, he still shouldn't have been able to give an entire village that much trouble. Hikari, Mabui shouted as she finally arrived at the scene. She immediately looked at the Jinin being held up by the neck. Huh? Did you escape from Big Brother? I guess he does have a soft spot for hot women. The twin brother spoke out with a grin. My type's more like this one here. He then dropped the Jinin on the ground allowing the little girl to finally get a breath of fresh hair, but he didn't allow her to get much time to relax. He immediately grabbed her by the hair and put a kanai to her throat. Well, you might as well look since you're here. Tea teacher, help me. Mabui could only tremble for a few seconds, realizing that if she moved, then her student was likely going to die. But then she simply stood still, all of her worries disappearing in an instant. Of course, he'd still be nearby. Behind the criminal stood another figure, squatting slightly with a palm on his cheek as he seemingly waited for the twin to notice him. After the man started trying to undress the genin, Ken somewhat realized that the man had no intention of looking around himself. Therefore, he decided to simply end the man's miserable life. With a swipe of his hand, the twin's head was cut into four different pieces. Splattering blood on the grass in front of him as the pieces flew off a few meters away from the rest of the body. Hikari, the genin, quickly dashed away when she felt the hold on her loosen, stumbling as she did so and doing a roll in order to regain her balance. Only when she turned around did she notice the black haired samurai from earlier squatting over the headless body of her previous assailant. There's no wanted poster for this one. How peculiar. Ken said as he started searching the man's body for anything useful. Well, anything that could remotely resemble a scroll. There was no report of this on our side either. They do look alike. Mabui spoke as she started tending to the injuries that the other genin had sustained. Hikari was still a bit too shocked to move. It would have been a traumatizing experience for most girls, but as a shinobi, she was trained for everything already. So she recovered quickly and went to assist her teachers only muttering a few words of gratitude to the samurai that was still inspecting the criminal's body. Possibly twins, their bodies are also the exact same shape, Ken said as he ran his hands through all of the pockets he could sense. To think there was no record of this? It can't be helped. He wasn't worth anything either. He was also weaker. It's hard to tell which one was the one with a bounty on his head, but I doubt anyone will be able to tell the difference. Ken eventually found only one scroll on his body and proceeded to store it away. Thank you for your help, Mabui said, bowing a bit towards the wandering bounty hunter. Don't bother, I still get paid and I did use you all as bait. Though, I'd advise you to have more caution in the future. Something like this was bound to happen regardless of my actions. At least I was here to take care of things this time. Next time though, Ken then waved his hand and turned to leave. I, I'll keep that in mind, Mabui said as she sighed and continued to tend to her wounded students. This time, Ken didn't stop, nor did any explosion interrupt his departure. Instead, his back disappeared into the forests. Neither Mabui nor Hikari did anything to stop him, not like they could. I guess teacher was right. He really was a lot more dangerous than he let on. Hikari thought to herself as she continued to tend to her wounded teammates. <laughs> Such an odd turn of events. I can't really blame Tasho for this either, 
as it wasn't exactly his job to gather intel on my targets. We were basically just relying on the bingo book records. It's annoying, not being able to read normal books. I'll have to gather information in different ways. Now, to give Tasho the bounty. The process we surmised is rather simple. A summoning jutsu. The perfect way to instantly transfer both information and the bounties I collect. This is something that Tasho thankfully already knew. His former Jonin teacher had gotten to help him learn this trick, though it took a while for him to remember it. The contract was also rather simple. All I had to do to sign it was feed a random turtle on my travels. Odd condition, but I am not one to judge. All I have to do is make a few quick hand signs, bite my finger, and tap the ground. I could sense my chakra spreading out, forming a summoning circle out of sigils. <laughs> In an instant, it was almost as if a small smoke bomb went off, and a large turtle with a gigantic green shell appeared in front of the blind swordsman. It was easily twice the size of a regular adult in height. Its limbs were thicker than tree trunks. Overall, it was a sturdy summon. Ken, the turtle spoke slowly. It wasn't exactly the energetic type. Nor was it a summon that could be used in combat against anything other than Jenin. Donatello. Ken's voice was also slow, his tone calm, not giving off any emotions. Stop calling me that. My name is Akira. The turtle's tone was still slow. It was also obviously feminine now that it spoke a bit more. And it was also clearly offended. Donatello, I need you to deliver this to Toshi. Ken held out the scroll storing all of the loot from his bounty hunt. Akira looked at Ken with lazy eyes, blinking slowly as she then took the scroll in her mouth. Please stop calling me and my family strange names. Akira spoke with a bit of desperation in her slow tone. Thanks. Talk to you later, Donatello. The turtle simply shook her head. Her eyes looked downcast, slightly disappointed as she then proceeded to disappear in a puff of smoke, undoing the transformation and taking the scroll with her. Tasho is to do a summoning at least once a week, so he'll get this scroll soon enough. Then, can simply continue jumping from tree to tree. On to the next bounty then. <laughs>